Okay, so we're going to be continuing our discussion of Aristotle here, focusing more on his philosophical views rather than his logic. Aristotle is an incredibly important person to become familiar with since he was he has an enormous impact on Western society. So uh, often in the Middle Ages, he was simply referred to as the philosopher, capital T, capital P, and also sometimes as the master of those who know. Now, this is a level, a sign of the level of respect that people had for Aristotle's views during this period of time. And most people thought that his views were, for the most part, absolutely correct. They had to be tweaked here or there, um, but there really was a feeling in the Western world and also in the Eastern world, to some extent, that Aristotle had put his finger on the most important components of the natures of reality and the way that logic and rational thought work. And that the rest of everybody else's job was simply tidying up, filling in the details, um, making these things um, clearer and more explicit and so on. And so if you had gone to college at, at this time, you would have learned Aristotle's views, not in a philosophy class where there was some debate and we could talk about where they ran up, but simply as the truth. Now, it's a very heavy and important thing to say. So Aristotle for, was the, uh, this period, and that's over a thousand years of t time we're talking about, was um, the Einstein, the Newton of his day. He was one who people just thought had absolutely nailed it. So whether you think he's right or whether you think he's wrong, it's important for us to get some kind of grip on what his actual thought um, about this stuff was. So let's start with the basics, uh, talking about philosophy here for Aristotle. So Aristotle divides philosophy up into two components. There are the theoretical fields, and in a theoretical field, what you're aiming for is knowledge. So physics is a theoretical branch of philosophy for Aristotle, biology, um, what he calls first philosophy, uh, which is metaphysics and epistemology. These areas aim for some abstract body of knowledge. But these are distinguished from what Aristotle calls practical components of philosophy, which don't aim at producing knowledge, but aim at producing some kind of action. And so for him, then, ethics is a practical science because the, the goal of science, uh, the goal of ethics is not merely to know what the right and the good are, but to produce the right actions and to good persons. So for Aristotle, two, politics um, would also be a practical science, and those would be distinguished from um, the, the more n theoretically oriented branches of philosophy. So what we've been calling natural philosophy, which is philosophy of the natural world, as well as metaphysics, are theoretical sciences. Ethics and politics would be practical sciences. Now, we're going to be focusing here on the theoretical area, and then look at the ethics course for Aristotle's views in the practical areas at least in ethics. I don't really talk about his philosophy of politics. Now, the goal for Aristotle in these branches, these theoretical branches of science, is to start with particular things, figure out what those things have as their essential characteristics, then to move to using these as premises in a syllogism. So Aristotle thinks that the way you categorize things is by the way that they're the same, and also they'll have a differentiating, different, differentiating quality, which is their essential attribute. So for instance, take human beings. Human beings are animals, uh, just like uh, dogs and cats and monkeys and zebras and so forth. But there's something which distinguishes us from all of the other animals, and that's being rational. So we are the rational animal, and rationality is essential to being a human being. So an essential property is one that makes it the kind of thing that it is, and which that thing can't lack without failing to be the kind of object that you're talking about. An inessential property is one that the object may or may not have. Uh, for instance, as a human being, whether I have hair or not is not essential to being a human being. Whether I have a finger even, or a toe, or a leg isn't essential. But what is essential to being a human being, at least according to Aristotle, is being rational. So all things are categorized this way. Uh, there's a a general species of which we belong, and then some genus that differentiates us from those species. So this is the way he would organize and categorize um, 
um, everything around us. Now, he, this d develops into a nice general method here. So you can see that on the left-hand side, you start with the general opinions of people who came before you. And Aristotle always starts his, his investigations with a canvassing of the views of his predecessors, people who came before. And um, this has been very useful to us because it's where we get a lot of information, for instance, about the pre-Socratic philosophers. They, a lot of that information about Parmenides and, and Zeno, etc., come from Aristotle's work where he's taking stock of the problems that were left to him. So then you engage in dialectic, which is, you know, coming from the Socratic method. So dialectic is involved, is this conversation, this deep conversation where you're trying to get uh, clear definitions and really get at the essential properties of objects. And you distill out from those first principles. Now, first principles are things like um, that are uh, th that distinguish the universal and necessary attributes of the things that you're interested in. So, for instance, all dogs are mammals, knowing that a uh, knowing that that's true is a first principle, and that allows you to do what Aristotle calls a demonstration. A demonstration is simply a valid syllogism. So the section on logic that we just covered is being put to use here. Um, that's one way that we come to know about the world. So this kind of structure here is different than Aristotle's, excuse me, than Plato's divided line. We have a, a part where we're ascending upwards from opinions through dialectic to distilling out the first principles, and then a portion where we're moving down from those first premise principles to conclusions about the way the world actually has to be. Now, a demonstration isn't just any old kind of syllogism, but it's a syllogism whose premises are necessarily true, which premises can't be false. And that's how you get knowledge about the world, according to Aristotle, is you start, you employ this method. Okay, so what he's interested in is an explanation. And an explanation for Aristotle really takes the form of a deductively valid syllogism. And that's because it doesn't merely tell us that something is the case, but it has to tell us why it has to be that case. So Aristotle's theory of science and philosophy is that we find necessary and universally true facts about reality. And then you're able to explain why reality has to be that way. So to really understand it, to really know it, we must be able to give the reasons why that thing has to be the way that it is. And these explanations usually take the form of valid syllogisms, which, as we've discussed uh, in the previous section, are arguments with two premise and a conclusion. So just as an example here. Suppose that you knew that copper conducts electricity. Now, Aristotle wouldn't have known that, but we know it. So what explains that fact about copper? Why does copper conduct electricity? Well, copper is a metal, and it's an essential component of metals that they conduct electricity. So now you can put this in the form of a syllogism. All metals conduct electricity. All copper is a metal. So all copper conducts electricity. Now you've deduced the fact that copper conducts electricity from these other facts, namely from the essential attributes of metals as they're being conduits for electricity and from knowing that copper is in fact a metal. Now you understand, according to Aristotle, why copper has to behave in the way that it does. So the goal of philosophy is to arrive at these kinds of syllogisms where we deduce the nature of reality from things which we already know to be true. Now, real first principles of a science are known directly by reason in a way that does, that does not need any further proof. And again, this is exactly like geometry and the, the heavy emphasis on the geometrical sciences that we've already seen in the work of every pre-Socratic pre philosopher, in the work of Socrates, and in the work of Plato. So, for instance, take the theorem of geometry that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. You can't give any evidence for that. That's the kind of thing which you have to just think about, and then you can see that it must be true. How could it possibly be the case that there's a shorter distance than a straight line? That's knowable just by thinking about it. It's knowable immediately and intuitively and doesn't need any further support. That thing can then be used to support other things, and so could be used in a demonstration, in a valid syllogism. 
Now, so for instance, less geometrically and more logically, Aristotle thinks that the law of non-contradiction is something that's immediately known by reason and can't be given any proof for. So the law of non-contradiction is the claim that no sentence or no fact can be both true and false at the same time. Notice Parmenides was talking about this. Zeno uses this idea. Socrates uses it when he talks about Euthyphro and his theory of justice um, with Thrasymachus. Uh, Plato uses these ideas. This is something that had been percolating in Greek thought for some time, and Aristotle distills it very precisely, gives it a name, the law of non-contradiction. Reality is such that no contradictions are true. Now, you can't give an argument for that claim, Aristotle says. You don't need any evidence for it. It doesn't need any support except itself. Once you understand the words, nothing can be both true and false at the same time, then you can think about it and see that it just has to be true. And that's, of course, what all of uh, the logic that we were just discussing in the previous um, um, lectures was based on. Because if you deny the law of non-contradiction, then validity, as we defined it, simply goes away. If some sentence can be true and false at the same time, then knowing that the premises are true and the conclusion is false doesn't tell you the argument is invalid because the conclusion might also be true. So it's only this law of non-contradiction, which tells you you can't have true and false, that allows us to build the system of logic which we were exploring. All logic is based on this idea. So the law of non-contradiction, according to Aristotle, is supposed to be a necessary truth about reality. So what that means is that it's impossible for it to be false. And notice that it has two interpretations, a metaphysical interpretation, whereby no object can have contradictory properties, and also a logical interpretation whereby no sentence can be have contradictory truth values. These are very different, obviously related, and Aristotle thinks that they are related and that the logical interpretation follows from the view about the nature of reality. Now, once you have this, you have a very powerful way of arguing, which Aristotle calls a reductio ad, ad absurdum, which simply means in Latin, reducing something to the absurd. So if you wanted to show that something was false or that something was true, what you could do is try to show that a contradiction results from it. So, for instance, if you want to show um, that X is true, to assume that not X, and then try to show that that leads to a contradiction, thereby concluding that the original thing which led to the contradi contradiction cannot be true. Now, now this argument form is employed a lot of times. Well, you say that P will assume that P is true. P leads to a contradiction, so P can't be true. That's a very powerful way to argue. Now, of course, this is, uh, I'm slipping under the carpet here, something which we should talk about, which is that you need another basic principle, which Aristotle calls the law of the excluded middle. Now, what the excluded middle says is that every sentence is either true or false, and that there's no third alternative. So every sentence is either true or false, and there's no third alternative, like not like non-determinant. Everything has a determinate truth value. And this gets Aristotle into some trouble, for instance, thinking about sentences about the future. There's a very famous example where Aristotle's considering the sentence, there will be a sea battle tomorrow. If you accept this law of excluded middle, like that sentence is either true or false already, even before the sea battle has occurred. And that leads to some interesting things, which we may come back to later, but we'll set that aside for right now. Okay, so one thing that we want to do is make sure that we understand Aristotle's attack on Plato. So Aristotle did not agree with Plato about the theory of the forms. Uh, he, he was very, 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 very clear that he thought that Plato was misguided in positing an eternal realm of non-physical, eternal and unchanging objects. Aristotle thought that all that there was was the physical world around us. So let's go ahead and try to understand what Aristotle's point is here. So Plato attempted to do what Aristotle was interested in. Plato attempted to try to give explanations for why the things must be the way they are. So, for instance, suppose you want to know why 
is that thing a human being? Why isn't it a dog? Well, Plato says, it's that thing participates in the form of human being. The form is eternal, perfect, and unchanging. It's the essence of what it means to be a human being, or in other words, it's the perfect human being. And it's this relationship of participation, in some sense, my resembling the perfect human being, uh, which explains why I have to be human as, and why I can't be a dog. Now, Aristotle's very unhappy with this notion of participation. It's extremely unclear. And in fact, what I want to try to show is that it really doesn't explain anything at all. So we can look at this picture here. This is Plato's picture. We have the visible world, which is physical, finite, and constantly changing, the world of becoming. And then we have for Plato the intelligible world, which is non-physical, eternal, and unchanging, the realm of being. And every human being in the visible world is related to some form, the form of human being, and it's that relationship which explains why those things are human. So Aristotle says, well, basically what we have here is a principle that for every group of objects, there's a form which explains what that group has in common. But now if we think about the form of human being itself and ask the question, is that thing a human being? It seems like Plato's answer has to be yes. It's the perfect human being. It's the flawless human being. It's that way forever unchanging. But of course, it's our resembling that thing which makes us human. But if that's the case, then we have a larger group, the group of all physical humans and the form. And Aristotle wants to know, what does that group have in common? Well, it seems like there must be some third form, the form which unites all of these things. But you can repeat this process as many times as you want, and it seems like you lead to an infinite regress. So we can put this in words as follows. The form is supposed to explain why it is that we call some things by the same name. But that name must also apply to the form itself. And that's because it's the thing that all instances of the form have in common. So it's sometimes easier to think about colors here. So if you think about all the blue things in the world, Plato says those things are blue because they resemble the perfect blue. Well, is the perfect blue itself blue? Well, yeah, it has to be an example of blue. But if that's the case, then you can create a new group. All of the physical instances of blue together along with the form of perfect blue. Now, what explains what those things have in common? Well, it's got to be this third form, this other form, the form of uh, which unites those things. But then you can create a group out of that, the physical objects, the form, and the form which explains what they have in common. And now you need to know what those, that group has in common. So you can do this for anything which has a form. All of the objects and the form, they must have something in common, and so on, and so on, and so on. So this generates what Aristotle calls an infinite regress, which means that you never get to the end. It just goes on forever. You can make bigger and bigger groups and always ask what those things have in common. So since there's no end, we never really get an explanation of why humans differ from dogs. We are simply told they resemble the form, which resembles something else, which resembles something else, which resembles something else. So this is what has, through history, become known as Plato, excuse me, Aristotle's third man argument. The third man argument is supposed to show that the theory of forms as developed by Plato doesn't accomplish its goal. So Aristotle rejects the theory of forms as developed by Plato. He also rejects atomism, which we discussed in the lecture on the priest. Aristotle's very disturbed by some of the central tenets of atomism. So the idea of void is contradictory. Remember, we've already discussed that a little bit um, because it implies that what does not exist, in fact, does exist. And Aristotle just denies that that's the case. He says that's a contradiction. That which doesn't exist can't exist, so there can't be void. He asserts that everything is filled at every point. So just as the space between you and, and your friend or, or the computer whatever is filled with air, so to every space is filled with something, whether we can see it or not. Um, and also Aristotle rejects atomism because if it were true, then the world would not be explainable in his sense. Because we couldn't say why the stuff around us must be the way that it is 
since, according to atomism, everything is ultimately the result of chance. So you can't say why a dog has to be a dog. You can't say there's some particular essence that dogs have. All you say is, well, randomly some atoms came together and they formed those things over there, and soon those will disperse, and that's the end of that. So Aristotle's deeply disturbed by this view, which he thinks um, is at odds with the way the world actually works. For Aristotle, the world is ordered, the world is law-governed, and it works according to necessary laws, which describe the way the world must be at any given time. As opposed to the atomists who said, ah, you know, it's all just chance. There's things, but atoms in the boot each other, some stuff forms, some stuff disintegrates. That's just the way that it goes. Okay, so Aristotle has to start over. And his starting over involves him giving an alternative explanation um, metaf in metaphysical system, which we're going to look at, which is known as the four causes. So he agrees that we want knowledge of essences. Remember, that's what Plato was after. The forms are essences. And in fact, he even confusingly for us, one word, form for these essences with a little f instead of a capital F. But the forms of Aristotle are not separate from the objects around us. So he agrees that there is some property which all and only dogs have and which is responsible for there being a dog. It's just that he doesn't think that that form is somehow separate from the object. So each object for Aristotle is composed of two parts the matter out of which it's constructed, and the form which shapes, so to speak, that matter. So a dog is composed, of, a particular dog, my dog, your dog, is composed of some material formed or informed by the form of a dog. So the form is somehow what makes that material be a dog. But the form is in there, in there. Aristotle argues that these two things, the form and the matter, are separatable in thoughts, but not in reality. So this is where Plato went wrong, according to Aristotle. He confused what we can do with the mind with the way reality has to be. So we can look at some object and separate out the property of being red and the property of being a ball. So we have a red ball. We can say, ah, the, there's the one thing, which is the redness of the ball, one thing being the ball. But it's a mistake to think that the redness can exist independently of the ball, according to Aristotle. The property of being red is located inside the object. The form of red is in the object, not outside of the object in which it stands in some relation. So Aristotle thinks that each red object has the very same form of redness inside of it. That's what they all have in common, the same. Now this leads to some difficulties because he is forced to say it's the very same thing which is simultaneously located all over the place. Now that sounds a bit strange to people, but Aristotle's fine with it. So again, for each red object, we can separate the redness, the form of red, from the material, but it's a mistake to think that those things can really exist apart. They can only exist together. So this was known as hylomorphism. And that's just a fancy word for saying that there are two things here, the form and the material. Now, even though these things can't exist, you have to have every material has some form and every form has to be in some material. But even so, the form is separate from the material. It's real, it's a real thing, it's just in the material. It exists as part of the object. Now, this is part of his response to Parmenides, uh, how change is possible. And he's going to argue that change consists in a material coming to have a form that it did not have before. And this is gonna solve a lot of problems, but we're gonna wait a bit to talk about that. So remember from before, that to really know something, Aristotle thinks that you have to be able to explain why the thing has to be the way that it is and cannot be some other way. That is, what we need to do is to be able to give the reasons why the change happened or why the thing is that way. Now, the word that Aristotle actually uses, etia, is translated as cause. 
That's a little bit misleading for modern people because really what he means is the reasons that explain why the thing happened the way that it did or is the way that it is. So really he's interested in the reasons. So let's consider some sculpture. So here you can see a picture of a sculpture of Socrates. There is his snub nose and his brows, as we discussed earlier, not an attractive person. So what are the reasons why this particular sculpture is the way that it is? Well, the sculpture is the result of a process and Aristotle thinks that there are four causes, each of which partially explains why it is and all together fully explain the way that it is. So, for instance, part of the answer is that this is made from a certain material. In this case, let's say marble. If it was made from gold, it would have different properties. If it was made from concrete, it would have different properties. If it was made from mashed potatoes or shaving cream, it would have even different properties. So part of the answer is the material that it's made out of, right? That you can already tell. Um, material is important. Now, the other part is the shape that it has. The statue is the way that it is because it's shaped like this, in a Socrates shape. If it were shaped differently, in an Aristotle shape, it would be a sculpture of someone else. So the shape, in this case, that's the form, partially explains why the statue is the way that it is. But of course, part of the answer also involves a person who sculpted it in order to achieve the end product, the sculpture. So actually there are four distinct reasons why the thing is the way that it is. These causes, Aristotle calls the material, formal, the efficient, and the final causes. Now, an easy way to try to figure out which is which is by thinking about them in a particular way. So if you want to identify the material, you have to look for the thing which stays the same during the process. So in every instance of change, there is some object which is the same as it undergoes the change. And that's very clear to see in this case. When the sculpture is making, uh, is making this sculpture, the marble stays the same through the process. It's not as though by sculpting it, you change it into spaghetti or change it into shaving cream. It's still marble at the end. So there's something that's undergoing this process. That's the marble. Whatever it is that's undergoing the process is the material cause. Now, the formal cause is the thing which actually changes. It's the difference. So the thing which is the same and then the thing which is different. So in this case, the marble is the same, but its shape is different. It no longer has the same shape that it did before. So now we know that the formal cause in this case is the shape of the statue. Now, the efficient cause is just the thing which initiates the process. Nothing just starts by itself, Aristotle thinks. There's always got to be some thing which initiates the change. That thing which initiates the change is the efficient cause. In this case, the efficient cause is the sculptor, the artist. That's the thing which is making the change happen, so to speak. And then finally no pun intended, we have the final cause. Aristotle says the final cause is that for the sake of which the change is done. So Aristotle is uh, uh, very teleologically oriented, where telos from the Greek word means goal or purpose. And so, so he thinks that everything that happens, happens for some purpose. Nothing that happens is completely random. And as Aristotle is fond to say, what we call chance is just ignorance of the actual causes. So if we really knew what was going on, we, wouldn't, we would see that there is no chance or randomness in the universe, Aristotle thinks. Everything happens for a reason. Now here, the final cause is the image or picture of the finished product that the sculptor has in his mind. So, for instance, a famous sculptor once said that when they looked at a block of marble, they could see the statue trapped inside of it, and all they were doing was trying to free it. And that's a sort of way of talking about this idea of final cause. The sculptor has an image of what the finished product is supposed to look like, 
And in their action, by chiseling, by hammering at the piece of marble, they are trans that image into the material of the marble. And this metaphor here is central to Aristotle's way of thinking. In every case of change, what you have is some material which is receiving some form which is being transmitted or put there by some agent in order to achieve the purpose of having the final product. And that, that sounds a bit confusing, um, but we'll look at several examples and try to get an, a hang of it. So now, just to sum up though, to give an example, to, excuse me, to give an explanation of change, Aristotle things, you need to specify all of these causes. So we've just done that for the sculpture. Why does the sculpture exist? Why is it the way that it is? Well, because it was made out of a certain stuff, because it has a certain shape, because an artist did it in order to get a statue with that shape. Now, it's important, though, to realize that the sculpture example can be a bit misleading. So when we think about the sculpture example, um, we can be led to think that material is simply stuff like marble, wood, gold, etc., we can be misled to think that form is simply shape and that efficient causes are always persons. But this is extremely misleading because Aristotle thinks that these categories apply to every process of change, including such things as objects falling, the planets moving, people walking, etc. Any process or change needs to be explained in terms of these four causes. So, for instance, and what the causes are depends on what you're trying to explain. So, notice that what we were earlier trying to explain was why the statue is the way that it is. Suppose that we were trying to explain why the statue was red as opposed to simply why it exists. Well, then we're going to get a different set of four causes. So, the material in this case is... The statue itself. The statue is the thing which is the same. It's not as though painting a statue red changes a statue from a, to a non-statue. So we don't talk about marble when we're trying to explain why the statue is red. We explain that by saying that the statue under process. So the statue is itself the material. In general, Aristotle counts a substance as any kind of thing which we can attribute properties to. Statues are substances, persons are substances, cows are substances, couches, etc. Um, now, the shape, excuse me, now the formal cause of this it has nothing to do with shape. So what's different uh, before and after the painting? Well, the difference is the color of the statue. So here, what we have is the form of red being transmitted into the material, the statue. Now, of course, there's got to be an efficient cause, and we're assuming that someone is doing the painting. So whoever's doing the painting is the efficient cause. But, of course, statues can become red for other reasons as well. So suppose that um, uh, uh, the statue is made of marble and it's sitting under water dripping on it. It may become discolored over time due to the water interacting with the statue. So the statue there would be acquiring a new form, the form of this color. The formal cause would be whatever color it's acquiring. But the efficient cause in this case would not be an agent, a person. It would be this process of dripping. Now, the final cause in this case is, again, related to the purpose which the process happens for. So if it's a person painting, then the purpose is uh, whatever envisioned as the goal by the person to paint the statue red. And in general, there's a very close connection between the formal cause and the final cause. The formal cause tells you what property the thing acquires. The final cause tells you why it occurs, why it acquires that property. And there's a tight connection between them. So if you know what the formal cause is, then it's very easy to identify what the final cause is. Okay, so I understand that this is all very um, new. So let's go through a couple of more examples. Let's suppose that we have a pan and we're heating the pan up. 
and we want to explain how the pan goes from cold to hot. We have a pan, it's on a fire. So what's the material cause here? Well, we want to know what thing is the same. And that would be the pan itself. It's this frying pan which is undergoing the change. So in this case, the pan is the substance. It is the material which is acquiring the new form. It would be wrong to say that the material is iron or steel or whatever the pan is made out of. That would explain a different fact. That would explain why the pan is the way that it is. It wouldn't explain why this pan is heating up. The pan itself, as a pan, is the thing which is undergoing the change. Okay, so now the formal cause is that thing which is different. So we have a cold pan, and then after the process, we have a hot pan. What's the difference? Well, the heat is actually the difference. And Aristotle would say that the form of heat has been transmitted into the material of the pan. Now, of course, there's always got to be something which does this transmitting, the efficient cause. And in this case, it would have to be something which has the form of heat already. The form of heat just doesn't pop into the pan from nothing. There's got to be something hot which transmits the form of heat into the pan. Now, of course, poor Aristotle doesn't know about chemistry, and so he doesn't know about chemical reactions whereby heat is seemingly generated without something hot being around already. Uh, and so this might be a kind of challenge to his view. Uh, so this might be a kind of challenge to his view, but we'll leave that aside for now. So for now, we'll just say there's got to be something which possesses the form already and is able to transmit it into the material. Now, of course, the final cause is related to the formal cause, as previously discussed. And here, the final cause is to have the form of heat in the material, right? To have the hot pan. Now, this is a, an important point that we need to stop and dwell on for a second. Aristotle introduces a distinction between something actually being a certain way and its potentially being a certain way. So, when the pan is actually cold, Aristotle will say that it is potentially hot, now, what that means is that the pan is able to receive the form of heat. So, potentiality for Aristotle is determined by the kinds of forms which a material is able to accept. So, for instance, the pan is not potentially an eagle because the, the pan cannot accept the form of an eagle and then be an eagle. The pan is an inanimate object and cannot be turned into an eagle by transmitting a form of eagle into it. So there are many things the pan is not. The pan is not potentially walking. The pan can walk. The pan is not potentially speaking English. The pan is not potentially um, uh, an eagle. It's not potentially the Queen of Elizabeth uh, III. It's potentially not the moon, and et cetera, et cetera. But yet there is a vast range of potentials that the pan has, all de determined by the material itself, the kind of thing that it is, and which forms that material is receptive to. So the pan is potentially hot, it's cold, it's warm, it's black, it's blue, it's orange. It has all of these various potentials, um, which are, again, determined by the kind of material that it is. Now, in order to become actually hot, as previously mentioned, the material needs to come into contact with something that is itself already actually hot. So, in Aristotle's terminology, the thing must possess the form of heat already. And what that thing does is transmit or transfer the form to the material. So notice that in our previous, ex in this example of heating up the pan, it's the fire which is the efficient. The fire is the thing which is transmitting the form of heat into the pan. It's not a person doing it. You aren't transmitting the form of heat into the pan. It's whatever hot thing is around, which has the form of heat already, is putting that into the pan. So already we have an example where the efficient cause is not a person. The efficient cause is something in the natural world, fire. So in a sense then, we can conclude, Aristotle says, yeah, you know, properties do exist in the same object, except as actuals and potentials. When the pan is actually cold, it's potentially hot. 
when the pan is potentially hot, it's actually cold, and vice versa. When it's actually hot, it's potentially cold. When it's actually blue, it's potentially red, and et cetera, and et cetera, and et cetera. Now, this solves the puzzle that we were discussing from before of how it is that you could explain how something changes. Change in this way. Uh, nothing, it's not the case that the heat came from nowhere. It came from the fire, which had heat, and is transmitting it into the pan. Um, and that heat was already there, in a sense, in the pan in the form of a potential which means that the pan could accept the form of heat. So you don't get something from nothing. Um, it's not the case that um, opposites really exist at the same place at the same time, except as one as an actual and one as a potential. Okay, so let's do another one. Suppose that we have and this, you drop it and it moves in a straight line down to the ground. Well, what explains this? Again, Aristotle thinks the four causes explain it. So we want to identify the thing which is remaining the same through the course of this change. And that'll give us the material. So we have this rock. We let go of the rock. It moves in a straight line down to the ground. When it gets to the ground, it's still a rock. So the change is that it was moving, changed location, but the thing is still the same. So in this case, the material is the rock. The material is the rock. And in fact, Aristotle defines earth as objects which move in a straight line down to the ground. All things which move in a straight line down to the ground when they're dropped are composed of earth. So this thing fall a rock. Now, it's important that we stop here for a second and remind ourselves that Aristotle rejects atomism and he endorses the older view that reality is composed of the five elements which have these sets of complementary properties. So earth is cold and dry, water is cold and wet, air is hot and wet, and fire is hot and dry, and then there's ether which is a divine substance um, which nothing on earth is made out of but all the heavenly planets are made out of. Very different view than what the atom is held or what we ourselves hold today. So now it's earth as something which is cold and dry has as its essential property moving down towards the center. Um, and all of these are in there, so to speak, in that they occupy a characteristic place in reality. So you have uh, earth at the bottom, you have water on top of that, air on top of that, fire on top of that. And there's common sense reasons for thinking that this is true. So for instance, earth, it should be at the bottom because earth will move through other things. It moves through air, it moves through air, it'll move through fire. But uh, those things cannot move through earth. So water should be on top of that for the very same reasons and air on top of that. And fire, of course, at the top because the natural movement of fire is upwards. So for Aristotle, each kind of thing in the world has a natural kind of movement, something which it possesses by its nature. Earth moves down, fire moves up. And this, of course, you can just observe. Things are made of earth will fall downwards when dropped, but fire is moving upwards um, uh, uh, when it burns. So then we can say that the material here is earth and the formal cause is something which Aristotle calls the heavy and the heavy is simply um, the form of moving towards the center of the universe, which is what he thought was going on here. The efficient cause is that. So this, this form, this rock, possesses with inside itself the ability to move itself in a straight line towards the center of the universe. Fire possesses within itself the ability to move upwards in a straight line away from the center of the universe. So these things, according to Aristotle, are not inert objects. They are things which possess abilities. They are doing something. And of course, the final cause then is to be at the center of the universe. That's where the process stops. That's the final goal of the rock is to be down there. Now, of course, it sounds weird to us modern people to say that the rock has a purpose when it's falling and that the purpose of that falling is to be at the center of the universe. But when Aristotle looks at the rock, 
he sees something purposeful. He sees something acting in a kind of manner in order to achieve a goal, the goal of being at the center of the universe. Very different from the way that we think about rocks and their movement. Okay, so... Um, it is the nature of Earth to move downward. Now, water moves downward also, though not as much, and I've already said why. Rocks fall through water, but nothing falls through a rock. Air moves up, and you can think about carbonation um, as it moves up through the water, little bubbles moving up. And carbonation is a natural phenomenon and would not have been unknown to the Greeks. And, of course, fire moves upwards most of all. Now, Aristotle actually thought that everything else is composed of these elements. So, for instance, take wood. Wood must be composed of earth and air. It's got to be composed of earth because when you drop it, it moves in a straight line down to the ground. But it's also got to have some component of air in it because when you put it on water, it doesn't sink. It floats. So that must be the upward movement of the air. So Aristotle thinks, ah, well, there must be a ratio in there of more earth to less air such that it's not enough air for it to float upwards, but it is enough air to sinking in the water. And this is, he goes through and actually tries to figure out the ratios of various things. Four parts earth, one part air, well, that will give you um, wood. Three parts earth, two parts air, well, that might give you blood, something like that. And all of the various things around us are composed of these um, basic elements. Again, a very alien view to our modern people. Okay, so I have to stress this because it's so weird for us. The pen is not being moved by anything external to it. So Aristotle thinks, excuse me, the rock is not being moved by anything external to it. Aristotle thinks that the pen moves itself. What it means to say that earth is heavy is that it has this power. It has this ability. What it means to say that something is fire is to say that it has the power to move itself upwards. So this is what Aristotle calls a natural process because the efficient cause is something which is internal to the rock process is uh, one where the efficient cause is external to the source of change. So the sculptor example, that's an artificial process. You kicking a rock, that's an artificial process. But a rock falling or an apple falling from a tree and hitting the ground, that's a natural process because the principle of movement is somehow contained within the actual object itself. All right, so just to sum up this stuff, Aristotle also gives several things, describes the way things fall and move around here, and they're all geometrically based. So one of his claims is that heavier bodies fall faster than lighter bodies. So, for instance, he thinks that if you dropped a 100-pound weight and if you dropped a 10-pound weight, the 100-pound weight would hit the ground first. That's a common sense kind of thing. Well, you see it's heavier, so it's going to be falling faster. And, of course, it's sort of a, uh, verified by our common sense everyday experience. If you drop a bowling ball feather, the bowling ball hits the ground first. If you drop a piece of paper and a pen, the pen hits the ground first. Common sense observation. So... Again, Aristotle thinks that the speed of an object is in direct proportion to the force applied to it. So he thinks that the natural, the natural position of objects is at rest. And that's because when you look around, objects are at rest unless you force them to move. Nothing, no inanimate object moves itself. Place of an object. And even when you drop something, it only moves so far and then stops. So objects don't move unless a force is applied to them, and those objects stop moving when the force is removed from them. Now, the last thing we'll note here is that the speed of an object is inversely proportional to the density of the medium it falls through. So, for instance, the denser the medium, the slower the object goes. If you drop a rock into water, the density of the water will slow the rock down, but of course, into molasses, the density of the molasses really slows that rock down. So it's inversely proportional. The more dense, the slower it goes. And then finally, summing up Aristotle's physics here, um, the motion of the planets, why do they move in circles, is due to them being composed of ether. 
Ether, Aristotle thinks, is a heavenly divine substance whose essential attribute is movement in circles. For instance, is made of this weird stuff. It's not made of Earth. If the moon were made of Earth, it would move in a straight line down towards the center of the Earth. It would fall on us and crush us. So the fact that it doesn't fall on us, Aristotle thinks, shows that it's made of ether, a special kind of substance which is found nowhere on Earth and which nothing on Earth is made of because nothing on Earth has as its natural movement circular motion. So this is a very alien worldview, one um, uh, we find so far removed from what we think as to really wonder could Aristotle have taken it seriously? The answer is yes. People thought these views were true all the way up until the time of Galileo, Descartes, and Newton, and they started. these people started breaking with this Aristotelian tradi tradition. And that's what we're going to be exploring in the next set of lectures.